First of all, my name is KRS-One, knowledge reigning supreme over nearly everyone. I'm also called KRS The One because I seem to be the first uh, in hip hop at a lot of things. Um, and I don't need to run down the stats, go Google it and figure it out. The state of hip hop, what is it right now? Uh, it's 2013, we just passed this, the uh, winter solstice, December 21st, 2012. Uh, of course, it was predicted to be a rough time for the planet. People are taking their predictions from the Mayan calendar, from the Hopi calendar, from the Egyptian calendar, uh, that, you know, it's the end of the world. This is this, and I'm only documenting this state that I'm in right now, uh, as the camera is on me. This is the state that, that we're in right now. People are just waking up and coming out of the shock that the world did not end uh, and that there was no reason to go underground or to duct tape your windows. But that doesn't mean that disasters uh, are not still happening on the, on the planet. Um, the world did not end, but the, but the planet still turns. And the people of the Earth should still be on high alert for sudden changes in the Earth's uh, terrain, uh, oceans, land, etc. I mention this as part of the state of hip hop because this is the state of hip hop. The state of hip hop, I, I feel today, is one of preparation, one of uh, intense preparation, not fear, not caution, not protection, but preparation, more like weaving a basket in in uh in anticipation of what's going to come in the basket it's like knowing it's going to rain so you put fashion something together to catch water before the clouds even come in the sky this is the state of hip-hop preparation and what are we preparing for we're not just preparing for disaster we're preparing for good times you see a lot of people say, oh, yeah, we want freedom, justice, equality. We want peace, love, unity. We want health, awareness, wealth. We want these things, but we don't prepare to receive them. So when they actually come, sometimes we miss them because we don't even recognize them. But a lot of times we do recognize the blessing falling on us, but we don't have the basket ready. We didn't weave the right clothes. We didn't have the, the bucket ready there to catch it. This is where hip hop is right now. We have such an opportunity coming our way. Such a rainfall is about to come our way. And we have to prepare our basket to catch it. And so the state of hip hop now, and, and, and let me go further, what is it that we're going to catch? We're gonna catch health, love, awareness, and wealth. That's what we're about to catch. Because this has been the affirmation for 40 years. Actually, the affirmation has been peace, love, unity, and safely having fun. But these are the effects of good health, loving relationships, awareness, and wealth. Not riches, but well-being. So, this is the first the philosophical, cultural part of the state of hip-hop. But even as I speak to you right now, what is the state of hip-hop right now? Hip-hop today, uh, in lowercase letters, lowercase h, lowercase i, lowercase p, dash or space, lowercase o, lowercase p, that hip-hop is now been reduced to a job. People do not approach hip-hop anymore as a state of being. It's now a way to quickly get money or to become famous. This has led people to approach the elements of hip-hop, rap, uh, breaking, graffiti art, DJ, and beatboxing as jobs, as uh, forms of lifetime employment. And even though they are, they, they are great forms of lifetime employment, breaking them, seeing graffiti art, DJ. This wasn't the original intent of these arts. This wasn't the original intent of why you even do these things. And so the state of hip hop today has to become one of returning to being as opposed to, you know, jobbing, 
uh, if there's such a term, employing, uh, fighting to be put to work, um, th this kind of thing, uh, only seeing the value in something based on what it can do for you. Uh, the only way you could see something value, the only way you can see something of value is how is based on how you can use it. If you can't use it, you don't choose it. That kind of mentality is what hip hop has become and needs to get away from, needs to mature from. Now, like I mentioned, that was lowercase hip hop and lowercase letters. Capital H, lowercase i, lowercase p, space, capital H, lowercase o, lowercase p. That hip hop, cultural hip hop, is in great standing. Breaking MC and Graffiti are DJing is exploding all over the world. More and more people are doing it. More and more people understand it. The average Joe in the corner will tell you, that ain't real hip hop. That's real hip hop. We didn't have that before, uh, just in our first even 30 years of, of, of uh, creation. We didn't have that. So coming into this now, these are the states, I would say, of hip hop. I'd put one more final piece on that the states of hip-hop or the state of hip-hop. The final state of hip-hop is the word itself, the state of hip-hop, the country or nation of hip-hop, the tribe of hip-hop. It's this mind state that I think is the total liberation and preservation of hip-hop. This is its total freedom and this is its total preservation. When we actually rise from the level of just doing hip-hop, and rise to the level of being it. We, we leave the level of just doing hip hop and we rise to the level of being it. And, and once you are it, then you can claim nationality, you can claim ethnicity. And this is where we, we need to rise to. Hip hop needs to become a state, a city state, nation state, whatever it is. But it needs to be recognized as a sovereign. This is also uh, the continuation of the civil rights struggle. Uh, the civil rights struggle, you know, Kwame Ture, uh, or better known as Stokely Carmichael back in the 60s, Black Power, um, Malcolm X, uh, 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 Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, uh, I'm actually thinking of Mega Evers, um, uh, you know, the Black Panther Party, the seminal figures that we think about when we think civil rights. Most of them came to the conclusion that civil rights needed to evolve into human rights. And most of these leaders were taking their struggle globally. So we see today what hip hop's purpose and meaning could be uh, in that sense to continue the civil rights struggle toward the human rights struggle. And when you look at the human rights struggle, it's not civil rights anymore, it becomes civilization rights the right to establish your own civilization, to live free as one would choose. We have to test the limits of our freedom or we really don't know to what extent we are free and to what extent we are still being oppressed. I think if we started our own nation, you would definitely test the limits of your freedom. You would see what other people are willing to tolerate of you and how other people really respect you. As long as you're under somebody else's foot, under somebody else's law, under somebody else's holidays, under somebody else's calendar, somebody else's way to die, somebody else's way to be born, somebody else's way to get married, as long as you're under that, you're not free. We could talk freedom all day and all that, but as long as you under someone else's tradition, this does not mean to not respect another person's tradition. That's different. That's being a total human being. But I'm talking about what is your innate tradition? What is it that wakes you up in the morning? What is it that you strive to be good at? Whose opinion matters to you? What community do you seek the, the respect of? This is your real culture. You may be black, white, whatever, Asian, Latino. It, it, it doesn't matter. Whatever your allegiance is to, that's your real nation. That's your real tribe. For me, my allegiance is with hip hop. Uh, I know I'm African American and I'm proud of that. I have a rich African American history, some of which I put on record. But if I really think about the innate essence of my being, who I really am. Well, I didn't call myself African-American. I was born into that title. 
Even my own name of Lawrence Parker, Lawrence Chris Parker, that, that name was given to me by my loving mother. But if I'm ever going to be free, I'm going to have to name myself. I'm going to have to live according to principles that I've created for myself. I'm going to have to join into the into a community or, or seek the honor and respect of a community that honors and respects me. Well, for me, that criteria is hip hop. And this is what I call the state of hip hop, which is actually the state of hip hop, the, the city state of hip hop, hip hop as a sovereign nation. Hip hop is magnificent. Hip hop is the greatest social movement, I believe, of the last 20th and 21st centuries. This is the greatest movement ever. And this I can't say enough about hip hop. And here's why. This is what you're not getting in, in mainstream media. First of all, hip hop is a human skill. Let's just start right there. Beyond being a multi-billion dollar industry in a time when the music industry is still collapsing, not just that. Not just the fact that people around the world, all cultures, love hip hop. Besides that, and I don't mean just rap, I mean breaking them, seeing graffiti on DJ, people love hip hop. I'm talking about, here you have a movement that is wedded, it is, it comes from the actual uh, innate essence of humanity itself. Hip hop is a human skill. Hip hop is one of the last things that humans can do without plugging into a wall. Human today, in, in our societies today, with the amount of technology that's going on, the, the vast speed by which technology is advancing and, and becoming into itself, it is always good to know that hip hop is around that promotes the use of human ingenuity over technology. What do I mean by this? I mean, breaking, MCing, graffiti or DJing, breaking is dance, MCing, speak, um, graffiti art, writing, DJing, cutting, mixing, and scratching, not the turntables, but the what you do to the turntable is DJing. In fact, if you look at DJing from a from a paleo uh, from a paleoanthropologist point of view, the cutting, mixing, and scratching of early humans is what creates everything from fire to clothing to agriculture. The cutting, mixing, and scratching. This is early human speech. Early human. In fact, beatboxing, making music with your bodies, this is one of the first things humanity did to communicate with one another. In fact, the Buddhists still hold the ancient, ancient tradition of sign language as a form of communication. Remember, sign language was the first communication even before speech. So you have beatboxing, a form of emceeing, which is just utterance itself, speech. And you have this cut and mix and scratch and DJ, uh, 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 graffiti art is, I don't even want to get into how, old, matter of fact, it's the oldest human handwriting on earth, graffiti art. It's called graffiti, what, what ancient humans actually do. And I can go on and on, but hip, hip hop is first a human skill. Hip hop is one of the last things that humans can do without plugging into anything. I'll keep on bringing and singing until your ears is ringing and steaming, gleaming and dreaming, true I'm seeing with meaning. I could do that all day. I ain't plugging to nothing. That means that hip hop raises my self worth because I could do this. Ah, uh, I could pop. Mm, mm, mm. I could get it. And that's a poor popping, but those who know how to pop and can actually see it. That popping and locking. Breaking, up rocking, windmilling, head, all of that, I could do without plugging into nothing. Or I can't do it, but others can do without plugging into anything. Beatboxing. <laughs> that right there, all day, you could do that, all, you don't have to plug into nothing. So right away, first, 
Hip hop is a human skill. You don't need to plug into nobody's system and draw from nobody's power to express it. Because hip hop is a human skill, it raises your self worth when you master it. In addition to that, I said earlier, hip hop is also a form of lifetime employment. It's not what it's meant to be, but you can approach it as a means of paying your bills, feeding your family, even sending yourself to school. I urge all students that are in college, actually, to take up the art of, of DJing at the least. Because if you can become a, a, a DJ, a good DJ, if you can master DJing, you can put yourself through school. You don't have to come out of school with debt. You can actually pay your way through school. Or if you come out with debt, put your degree on the side for a minute and master DJing. The DJing could pay for your degree. It'll pay off your debt. DJs are getting five, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars for two hour sets, one hour set. But you gotta be good at what you do. So where would you rather put your time? In something that is gonna put you behind a desk? Something that might not match your actual purpose in life or what your joy really is? Or do you want to put your time on something that may not even be your purpose either? But while you're searching for your purpose, you're traveling, you're getting uh, uh, publicity, fame, and reputation, you're meeting people, you're doing your thing. Be a DJ and you're making money. Be a DJ at the least. This is the greatest thing with hip hop. This is just a little bit of it. I'll give you one more piece and I'm going to cut it off. I'm going to give you one more piece and then I'm going to cut it off. Here's what's so great about hip hop. This is a spiritual piece. Hip-hop is the only spiritual practice on earth that is without sin. Mm. I know I sound crazy right now, but I'm going to explain myself. Here it go. Hip-hop is the salvation of the world spiritually. Here's why. Because hip-hop is first a new spiritual path. What is the hip-hop spiritual path? Well, first of all, we believe God. And we don't, we, we don't believe that we're outside of God. If God is omnipresent, omnipotent, all-knowing, all-seeing, the Alpha and the Omega, how is hip-hop not part of God? Now, if hip-hop is part of God or a part of divine intelligence, cosmic consciousness, the love of the universe, then what is our purpose for existing? Why did the infinite mind of the universe, eternal mind, why did it think us up? For what reason? What's our purpose? Why are we here? Well, your purpose and why you're here is always right in front of you. So when you look at hip-hop and you look at it, we're uniting the world. We're actually uniting the world with a language that goes beyond words and talk. We're, we are uniting the world around the vision of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the I Have a Dream speech, where he says men and women are not judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Nowhere else in the world do you see that but in hip-hop. Nowhere. It's not being practiced nowhere, but in hip-hop. So right away, you see, we have a spiritual mission as well. Hip-hop is the salvation of the world. Why? Because it's innocent. What makes it innocent? We are not in control of ourselves. We don't have our own land. We don't have our own temples yet, our own schools, our own courts. How can you blame a person? How could you judge a person who is not free to live their own selves, live their own lives. Either we're oppressed and can't be judged, or we're free and can be judged. Only free people can be judged. Now, of course, I believe in my freedom. I believe freedom comes from within and comes out. So I accept the responsibilities for myself and my culture. But if you look at this politically, if you look at it spiritually, if you look at it logically, any angle you want to come from, if we do not control our own land, if we do not control our own means of survival, then you can't judge us. God will not judge us. We're like children, innocent, in, in need of knowledge. We're almost silly at times as a, as a group, as a, as a total group, the way we act, the way we depict ourselves on television, the way we're being depicted in mass media. We're not in control of this. So the only way you could judge a person 
is if they're in control of their actions. Anyone who is not really in control of their actions is what? Innocent. So the life of KRS-One before uh, Scott LaRock, before Boogie Down Productions, actually before 1985, uh, the group Boogie Down Productions, Boogie Down Productions, uh, was formed in 85 by myself and Scott LaRock, Scott Sterling. Scott Sterling was a social worker at the shelter, uh, a homeless shelter, and I was one of the 740 homeless people there. Most of my story goes forward from there with the social worker, Scott Sterling, becoming my um, DJ. But before this, counting backwards, 84, 83, 82, 81, I'm in the street, basically, uh, off and on. It started at about 13 years old. It started really at about 12, 13, somewhere between there. I had a vision of myself, and it was, it was really a, a spiritual moment for me, maybe because I was young, maybe whatever it was. I always remember it <clears throat> as one of these moments where... It was, it was more than a dream. It was more than just uh, an idea that enters your head. I saw myself teaching people through rhyme, through poetry. And I saw myself as a philosopher, as even a prophet. Uh, and I saw myself rhyming to people in that way. Now, when I was coming up, rap or emceeing, as it was known then, E-M-C-E-E-I-N, emceeing. Uh, also M dot C dot I N G, Master of Ceremonying or MCing. This art, DJing and MCing in the playgrounds of New York, Bronx, Brooklyn, mostly Manhattan, uh, Harlem, uh, this is the only place where we was able to see a DJ or see an MC. We saw them uh, at the park. And I just knew in my own heart that. I was going to be a DJ or an MC or a graffiti writer, b-boy. I was one of these people or all of them. This scene, this early scene that we used to call the jam, this early scene which would become hip-hop is what I gravitated to when I was like 10, 11, 12 years old. By the time I get to 12, 13 years old, entering my teenage years, I've already made up in my mind I'm an MC and a philosopher. That's it. I told this to my mother. She agreed with the philosopher part, but the MC part, it was, it was too young. It was too new to even understand how a person would even make a living doing this. And so a few things, one thing led to another, and I wind up leaving school, which was not good with my mother at all. I was in junior high school. I got left back in the eighth grade twice. I never really seen high school. I was supposed to go to Grady. Uh, William Grady High School in Brighton Beach, Brooklyn. Never really went. Um, and then I guess I was supposed to go to college. Of course, never saw that. Uh, but where I was was the Brooklyn Public Library uh, is where I began to educate myself. I got in there, started reading philosophy while writing rhymes on, on the side, but mostly trying to form a conversation. I wanted to be able to discuss philosophy with other philosophers or if someone asked me, you know, so what do you do? What are you doing? Uh, kind of thing. I, I wanted to be able to say, I am a philosopher and here's what I could be, here's what I can uh, discuss. So I'm in the library giving myself a conversation, basically. I'm studying new words, vocabulary words, I'm writing down on toilet tissue uh, along with my rhymes. Um, and I'm studying philosophy, all kinds of different brands of philosophy. Uh, I'm getting into that, uh, the origins of knowledge and uh, the origins of causes or what is it that causes a thing to uh, metaphysics, basically, uh, the first causes of, of, of things, uh, uh, where knowledge actually comes from, things like time, space, of course, Einstein, uh, Copernicus, uh, and this is where philosophy leads you to, um, Sir Isaac Newton and all of them, uh, because back then, science and philosophy and spirituality really came out of the same mind. So when you're back there studying philosophy, and you're down, you're past the 17th century, 1615, even going before Christ, 
you start all of this starts to mesh together. So I got a wide range of information just studying philosophy. So one day I um find myself out in the street after a big argument with with my mother. And I'm out in the street and I'm now I'm I'm actually kind of happy that I'm out in the street. Uh, because now I really can pursue my goal. And this is the kind of insanity that I went through. And I have to use the word insanity because that's what it was. I had to actually psych myself out to believe that I was KRS-One or this character that I was going to self-create as. And I, and I hope I'm saying the right thing because it's so insane what I'm even saying. To, to think yourself into the reality you want to be in, too, uh, is a form of insanity. And so here I am out in the street, homeless, insane, uh, dreaming myself as KRS-One, as this person that I'm not yet. But I'm only wanting to be this person, and the beginnings of this person started in the street. So I'm in the street, I'm living there, uh, park bench, I'm educating myself at the Brooklyn Public Library in the day because it's warm there too. And I managed to make it over to the Manhattan, the Manhattan Public Library, Manhattan, the Bowery, Men's Shelter, all of that. From there, I go out to, to the Bronx, to 166th Street in Boston Road. There, I meet a social worker named Scott Sterling. And this is where Boogie Down Productions kind of, begin, kind of begins. It's this homeless guy seeking his own vision and dream, childhood vision and dream, by the way. When I met Scott, I was 21. Uh, and seeking his childhood vision and, and dream uh, through the shelter system, through being homeless, through having nothing, really, and living this kind of insanity. I meet Scott Sterling, so yeah, and that's how it began. You know, I personally am not the type of person to advocate that a, 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 a civilization should be armed, but I'm not naive to believe that other civilizations are not arming themselves up to invade, uh, uh, protect themselves against a, whatever perceived threat. The, the problem is not so much guns. It's, it's the arms race that seems to be within the minds of humanity. If one guy has a stick and, and he has a stick for protection, I suddenly feel less than him because he has a stick. So I start reaching around for my stick. And at least he's not going to club me over the head with his stick. I know this is going to sound crazy uh, coming from a person, KRS-One, someone who advocates peace, uh, someone who still stands by the term stop the violence. The craziness of it all, though, is that I don't think you should ever give up your gun or your weapon, your knife, your stick, uh, your baseball bat. In, in a society, in, in the societies in which we live, it un it's unfortunate that we haven't gotten past the more animalistic instincts of rape, the strong survive, only the strong survive, the strong overcomes the weak, this kind of mentality. You would think in a civilization that human beings can agree on coming together nonviolently, that the one thing we're not going to be in this particular society is violent. You would think that humanity can come together like that and at least live in certain pockets of existence like this, but this is not the case. What's the case is, it seems that if you are lumped in to what seems to be an outdoor psychiatric nursery for human beings. That's what we call a city. An outdoor psych psychiatric nursery. If this is where we are, if this is what it's really about, you can't give up your weapon because the arms race is on. A clear psychopath is with you, living with you, riding on the train with you, 
a person who may be depressed, manic depressant, not that this is to be taken lightly at all, but a person who could snap at any moment is always with you in a society, always. People who want to do you harm separately from those who could snap, those who just have conditions of the mind you are living with daily, separate from them. You have people who want to rob you, want to overpower you, want what, what you have, want to take by force. You're living amongst them, too. I can go on and on, but if you're living amongst this type of person, this type of group, these groups are around you, I cannot advocate that any person give up their weapon at all. In fact, what I would advocate, advocate is that you learn how to use your weapon well, that innocent people do not get harmed if you ever, God forbid, have to pull your weapon out. You know exactly how to use it. You know for what length of time you're going to use it. And you operate like a shogun. Uh, you show no emotion. Uh, you don't put anger on it. You don't put fear on it. You don't even put happiness on it. What you put on it is the threat is stopped. The threat is stopped. Once the threat is stopped, there's no reason for your aggression or hostility anymore. This is the way I would advise that a person uses their weapon. It's not the weapon itself. It's the consciousness that's holding the weapon that determines whether that weapon is going to be violent, nonviolent, destructive, or creative. You know, I have a lot of respect for the British royal family. Uh, and I know that's light words, so I have respect. I don't even know them. Uh, but I can only imagine what it must be like to be part of the royal family. And I mean, even the darker parts of that, being born into a family of such high prestige and what you have to accept of your family. In a lot of ways, we all share the same problems as the British royal family, born into a family that you know, has its dark secrets and its major victories. And you have to try to uphold the victories and try to either mend the sins of the father or try to forget them altogether. <laughs> either way, um, the British royal family, I think, is a, is a good uh, uh, microcosm of all families in a lot of ways. Uh, it's still a family. People don't agree, they don't get along, there's betrayals, there's ignorance, there's all kinds of things going on. But there's another word that's attached to that family, and that's called royal family. Moving away from the British royal family and moving just into a royal family, there are many throughout the, the, the world, actually, real royal families. But what is it to be royalty? What, what is it to really be royal? Uh, to be that. To me, uh, when I look at what a queen or a king, a prince, princess, uh, when, when I look at that, I notice that I take it from the ancient African point of view, uh, where the king was a divine ruler, um, someone that uh, y y you didn't, uh, this person didn't have to campaign for you to believe in them. This person didn't have to spend uh, millions of dollars to convince you through media that this person was the king. When this person walks in the room, you immediately know through vibration that this person is the king or the queen or the prince or the princess. Uh, you know this. A real king uh, does not ha ever have to say he's the king. A real queen never really has to say she's the queen. You know who the king or the queen is simply by the person's character, by the person's aura, by the person's reputation even, which is even after that, but nonetheless reputation. So, again, royal family, first you got to have some power on you, some real power. And this is where I would split the the point of view. I, I would split it uh, uh, and say, well, there is a the true royal families, families of kings and queens, no doubt. Um, but then there is the royal family that is like like the Jacksons, for instance, uh, would be called a royal family. Um, uh, even um, uh, Run's house, that's not the name of his family, the Simmons family, I guess. 
uh, in, in, in that sense. That would be a royal family where, you know, people who the whole family is considered special, celebrity, uh, this kind of thing. I consider my family a royal family uh, as as well. My wife is phenomenal. Older sons, uh, daughter, we, we, we're all out of control. Uh, and I'm proud of my family, no doubt. But the pride of a father doesn't make your family royal. What makes your family royal is that they are upholding the royalty, the tradition, the the breastplate. Uh, they're holding that up of the family. And this is another piece of being royal. It's not just exuding some sort of uh, honor when you walk in the room, but also, can you uphold your traditions, your regular family traditions? This is also a form of royalty. So a royal family just in the end, not only is it uh, the British royal family, uh, African royal families, Asian royal families, uh, in, in that sense. Not only is it that, but a royal family is also a family that's alive and vibrant, and people know that family over there is really doing it. Zinaru, <laughs> what it do? Okay, so here's the deal. The, um... They have a DJ up there who has vinyl and all this other uh, type of stuff yeah. uh, uh, up there. I have the CD. Oh, what are they just, I just saw somebody with the CD. Oh, 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 oh uh, Sun, Sun One has it. All right. I just gave the CD to Sun One. Okay. Uh, track 15 and track 7 on the CD that you gave me, the beat CD. Yeah. I wanted to hear that louder. Okay. So I brought the CD. Okay. okay and so it. I'm going to play track 15 and track 7. Sorry, I just wanted to hear... In that order, 15 and 7. Yeah, how, how it would sound. Right. They have the rest of the show CD. Okay. Uh, loaded up into okay. their computers, but it's gonna break up the show CD, and okay. no one's gonna know. It's just gonna be a free fall. Okay. I'm gonna open up, yeah, with rhymes, okay, yeah. on the same vibe as what everybody's been listening All to, right. All right. and then break it down to the lecture, right. uh, to our, our discussion. Simone is coming back uh, okay. with the boards, okay, uh, and I'll, I'll go right into uh, after I spit, maybe. Who knows? I fall. I just feel it. You yeah, know, I yeah, feel yeah, it. Yeah, no doubt, and yeah. then uh, we'll break it down. So the boards, you know, you'll know which ones to pick up based on what I'm speaking about. All right. Some of them are the ones from Jamaica. There's, a, you know, those are the yeah, ones yeah, yeah. from Jamaica. You, you know, but I think I'll. I, I'll, it's kind of dark in here, so I think I'll be t uh, using the white and black. White boards with black letters. Okay. Hip-hop and other things yeah. like that. So uh, that's that's really it. So that, it that's that's really where we are. So I'm going to talk to the people right here. Um, so here it is. I'm back again. This is a little different uh, scene here. This is um, a small little spot, actually. This is between tours. Actually, I came from Australia uh, a couple of months. Actually, it was Aust it was, a, it was a, uh, Australia, America, and Europe together uh, over about a seven or eight month period, and then we just came into uh, California, bed down for a little while to chill out for a minute, uh, and that's why. We, and so we now we're here, uh, you know. Uh, we never really stop. It doesn't really ever stop, but it does calm down. Uh, you know, not the big festivals overseas or the Key Club on Sunset or House of Blues or those kinds of venues. We like to break it down to just small venues where you invite a few people uh, and, and really get your skill off, really get your, your, um, your purpose off. For me in this instance, this is uh, a, a, an opportunity to teach and to uh, perform. Uh, there's a few beats I wanted to put on real quick. And I listen to them in the house, but I, I, the, the best way to hear a track and hear yourself on it is always to bring it live. So, and here's somebody beatboxing now. This is, yo, what up, money? Uh, somebody sound like they in there doing their thing. That's just sound. Hold on. Real hip hop is not dead. Here, come outside with me. No, no, you, you keep your hand. See, look at this. This is where we at, right here. Real hip hop is not dead. You just gotta know where to look. You gotta know where to go to actually get it. And um, this is the point. 
This is the point to the temple of hip hop. This is the point to my involvement in hip hop around, you know, during this time, 2013. Uh, this is what it's become. We teach it now. We form environments where original hip hop can be heard and felt and experienced. Uh, it's beautiful. Turn it up. Yeah. Let that rock. Let that turn rock. Turn it up. Turn it up. This is how I always spit. Live off the top, how I wrote my hits. See, I come back live like this freestyle. I've been doing this shit from a little bit. Listen, listen. The camera on me. You. One, two, three. I want you to make a DVD. And you be a witness of a DVD. But when you make your DVD, give 20% to me. We do a business. This is lyrical, physical fitness, KRS. That spells knowledge, reign supreme. And I'm gonna show you what it means. Live off the top. This is what we call hip hop. Damn, I used to do this shit on my block. 1973, Cool Earth, Bronx. Damn, we did the work. We was on floors like this, boards like this. I was about seven or eight. See, I'm spitting raw all day. You better listen to what I say. He's the DJ. And what I need to say is that I'm the MC and he's the DJ. People don't talk like this no more. What they do is spit a record and run out on tour. For me, this is before I was on John back in 1985. See, I drove myself here right off the 405. This is a wonderful, wonderful moment. Let me show you why and how. Because most people, when you think back to the history of hip hop, the, 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 like how it started and all of that, in our minds we have visions of these, these brilliant places and dark houses or big venues and all of this is not the truth. This is exactly how how hip hop breaking of seeing graffiti on DJ and beatboxing. This is how it started. With about this many people and me like this on the ground or on the floor like this, not a 12 foot stage, not big speakers and things flying, none of that. Just like this right here. The reason I point this out is because this is a great place to start, take a break for one minute and get some real knowledge in your head. This is, uh, the reason I say that this is a, 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 a historical event, a great event, is because what I'm going to tell you many millions of people would like to know but can't know because they're not in history. They're not here right now at this very moment. Imagine out of the whole globe, out of the whole entire earth, you, KRS One, are here. But whilst we are here, hip hop is here right now. Now, of course, hip hop is doing a whole bunch of things all over the earth. But as these cameras are rolling right now, you are here with me at this time right now. That means these cameras are going to outlive us. Imagine, these cameras will be around in, say, 3,000, the year 3,000, 3,100. And they're not going to say, oh, this room was, you know, there was a, uh, uh, there was a whole bunch of people here that, uh, let's see, uh, it was African Americans, Asians, Latino, uh, Native American. No, they're not going to say all that. They're going to say, yo, back about 100 years ago, hip hop was back in this room. Look at how they was rhyming. Look what they had on. Look what was going on. And they're going to rely on every piece of what we are doing right now to determine their heritage, to determine what their legacy is. Imagine, <clears throat> imagine right now, I am recording history. Right now, this is how real it really is. If I stand here and go, yeah, yeah, that's now in history. I can't take it back. That's it. It just went out. If I go like this, uh, that's now in history. Can't take it back. I just added that to history. What if I said, know thyself, and thou shalt know the universe and God? That too is also in history. And now you can take that example and put a whole bunch of other things into history. The problem here is, 
History determines your legacy. The history determines your heritage. History gives you your future power. It gives you what? You say, well, I'm claiming this. Why? Because they did that. Oh, I'm part of this. I come from that. A person who has no history is at the whim of everyone else who does. A person who has no history is at the whim of everyone else who does. That means, and that's what we've been doing. This is what this is the deepest part to understanding history, uh, understanding hip hop, and that's why I start with history. You're in history right now. This is your history right now, being created before your very eyes right now. We knew this back in 1973, 76, 79, 83, 86. We knew this. We were conscious of it. Hip hop is not a mistake. We weren't bumbling around and discovered breaking. No. Here's what you need to know about this magnificent culture. First, the history of hip hop is not in a book. It's here, right here. This is it. This is the history of hip hop happening right here. Right. What you do say be in this matrix called history is going to become your children's legacy. See, this is why it's funny. In the 90s, when <clears throat> to be a rapper, you either had to be a gangster thug or some scantily dressed woman on a beach, specifically. <laughs> and we used to always look and say, what are those people going to do when they're grandparents, when they are grandparents? Okay, you're 18 now, or you're 16 now, or you're 25 now. So you're dancing in front of the camera and recording for all history of who you were and how you were when you were 18, 19, and so on. Now, years go by, you're 60. And now your 18-year-old is running out the house with something short on at 12 o'clock at night. You're like, where you going? Well, Mar, I got your video. Mm. How you telling me with you? Mm. Yeah. This is what parents are going through right now as we speak. Mm. They don't realize the importance of history and how what you do in this space is going to become your children's heritage and legacy and your power to guide them in the future. You give up your power when you don't live honorable. All right. mm -hmm. You give up your power when you don't live virtuous lives. Mm -hmm. This is the reason for righteousness, not to look good before God. Right. You already look good before God. The reason for righteousness is that you look good before yourself. Yeah. That you know to yourself, I have not done no evil. Therefore, there's no guilt on me. Therefore, I can think clearly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. History first. This is important for hip hop. This is the importance in understanding hip hop. First, understand its history. Its history is not in a book. Its history is made by real people every day. The legacy you set down for your children is actually your movements today. Whatever you're doing, thinking, recording, and putting out today, your children are going to use that as their claim to power. Right. Having said that, so looking at his, looking at your place in history, what you are becoming now is called conscious, conscious, awake, not conscience which is the feeling of good or bad, you know, moral uh, feelings. I got my conscience is off because of some act. Not conscience, consciousness. Being awake, aware, alert, that. This is the next part of hip hop you gotta understand or overstand. Hip, the word hip means to know. It's a form of intelligence. Hop is a form of movement. It's a springing upward to hop. Hop also means to move forward by leaps. Hip is actually 
not even an English word, it's actually an African word called hippie cat. And it means one who is aware of, of his or her environment. This is where we get the term hip from. It, it comes from Africa into English. And we lose the cat part and get just hip or hippie, H-I-P-I, hippie. It always meant aware, always meant keenly aware of one's environment. In English, it's also now trendy, fashionable, this kind of thing, to be hip. Uh, means to be trendy, to be fashionable. But originally, if you look at the word hip, the real word hip, uh, it has several meanings. Also, uh, a seed part of a rose bush, like the, the, the seeds of a you know, rose bush, that those are called hips. Hip can also be, um, well, it goes on and on. I, I won't get into it here. Let me think about all the definitions of hip. Uh, but the one we're concerned with here is the one that deals with awareness. Uh, hip meaning to be aware. You hit me to that. Uh, I'm hip to my environment. I'm, I, I know what's going on. Hip. Ha, obviously, the movement is bringing forward. Now put that together for yourself. And this is, this is not theory. This is what these terms are. Hip meaning to know. Ha, a form of movement. Hip, awareness, knowing. Hop, movement, leaps, jumps. It's not so much the art that is or is not hip hop. It's the actual definition of the term itself. Hip, intelligence, awareness. Hop, moving. That intelligence is moving around. So when people are not expressing their real consciousness, they're not being hip hop. Oh, I am. Do you know why you yes. move? Why? This is, this is the piece right here. Do you know why you move? And this is what hip hop forces you to think. This is a mental strategy. This is what happened to us. To understand that you're in a space and you're creating this history as you go. And if you are awake to that, then you are real hip hop. You are the history that's being created right now. You should look at yourself as that. Think of it this way. There's no school for KRS-One. There's no place that you can, that I can go to become KRS-One. The first thing hip hop teaches you is that you are the intelligence jumping forward. Self-creation. Someone else does not have the ability at this level of consciousness to define you. Here's another look at it. My mother named me Lawrence Chris Parker. I named myself KRS Mark. The reality is, is that I start out as Lawrence K. Parker. But in order for me to own my reality, I have to name myself something else. As long as I'm Lawrence K. Parker, I live in a Lawrence K. Parker reality. This is the importance of your name. This is the importance of hip intelligence. What you call yourself every day, that's your reality. That's what you're building for yourself. That's what it is. So what do you call yourself? I said, well, I'm knowledge reigning supreme. In this age where technology is robbing us of our ability to think, yeah. think, <laughs> technology is robbing us of the ability to think, hip hop comes as one of the last of the human skills. Hip hop is last of the human skills. It's one of the last things that human beings do unto themselves without having to plug into anything. I can say right here, I'll keep on bringing and singing and to your ears it's ringing and seeming, gleaming and dreaming, true and seeing and meaning. I can do that all day. I, I can do it without a mic. That, this thing, this thing that I am doing, this art called MCing, is generated from a human being. Right. So therefore, the very art itself frees me from a system based on technology. Right. If you can understand, let me see the elements, let me see elements of hip hop, anything that looks like elements themselves. If you can understand the, the elements breaking of seeing graffiti on DJ, beatbox, and street fashion, street language, street knowledge, street entrepreneurialism, if you can understand these elements, they're not just entertainment, they are free.
dope. This is the, this is how we did it. Don't just look at the rapper on MTV. This is the mind state that we had to be in. I only articulated it in this way. DJing is not the turntables themselves. DJing is what the DJ does to the turntables. That is DJing. DJing is not the equipment. DJing is not the headphones. DJing is what the human does to these things. Cutting, mixing, scratching, that's DJing. And of course, beatbox and fashion language. Look at these art, music, reading, mathematics, wealth. If you can understand it like this, you're free. You're looking at a free man right now. Forget the talk. This idea is what has freed me. This is why I'm giving it to you right now. This is so real. If you keep calling yourself Lawrence K. Parker, <laughs> you will exist in a Lawrence K. Parker reality. It is really that simple, and people don't think it is, so they don't do it. They don't try it. I dare you tonight. Try what I'm saying and see if it doesn't work. It does work. <laughs> see if it doesn't work. You gotta see if it doesn't work. See, this is what it is. But, I, and I'm willing to put, I'm, we're recording it right now. It's right here. I'm putting myself down in history. It's my legacy right here. I will repeat the, the um, United Negro College Fund sum that last part up. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. Amen. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. And this is what technology is doing to us. As great as technology is, and the mind creates technology. So we're not here bashing technology. We're being recorded technologically. And this mic is amping my voice. It's great. Technology is good. But technology is the science of mechanical and industrial arts. It's not civilization. Right. Civilization is an advanced stage in social developments. When human beings get to advanced stages of communication, we can call ourselves civilized. What we live in today is what is probably called a technological society. This is not civilization. Civilization means we all get along with each other. We don't need no cops. We don't need a military. That's when you have civilization. Advanced states in human interactions is civilization. We replace that meaning with a cell phone or a computer or a plane or a car or a boat. Any of the machines or the tools that we use to help civilization has now become civilization itself. We now rely more on GPS than our eyes. Yeah. Than our own eyes. I see people standing on the corner asking GPS if it's alright to cross the street. Is it alright to cross the street? <laughs> on a phone. Now that's of course an extreme. But take a look. When do you become human? At what time in the day, what hour of the day are you not plugged into something or relying on some technology to exist? At what point in the day? And you got to ask yourself, wait a minute, I'm a human being. You're not grabbing pieces of me and making me answer my phone. And, uh, no, wait, let me grab hold of myself. I'm hip-hop. You know, the Temple of Hip Hop began in 1996. Uh, the Temple of Hip Hop is a hip hop preservation society and ministry. Notice the words, hip hop preservation society and ministry. You know, uh, we take our cue from the fact that Africa Bambada from Zulu Nation, that's the real first hip hop preservation society. Uh, they may not have used those terms, but the work that was being done was actually the preservation of hip hop. That's Zulu Nation all day. From there, we get the elements of hip hop, the original elements, breaking, emceeing, graffiti, art, DJing, knowledge and overstanding. It's this knowledge and overstanding piece that we take and form the temple of hip hop. If you notice within uh, our gospel of hip hop, we have 18 overstandings. The overstandings, which is also a term used in a variety of spiritual circles, 
uh, uh, this term is beyond understanding. Understanding is comprehension, intellectual comprehension. I understand what it is you told me. I comprehend it. But overstanding is when you actually have experienced your comprehension. Not only do you comprehend it, but you have an experience with your comprehension. You overstand it. So the temple of hip hop is designed to actually preserve, do the actual preservation work. And when we started to do the research uh, to put together our body of knowledge, we realized that we are not just doing hip hop, breaking MC and graffiti or DJing, we are also uh, it itself, we are being it. We're not just doing hip hop, we are hip hop. We are the actual utterance of that term. When, that, when you say hip hop, you don't think of nobody but us. This is a specific term. So I say all of this to say that there's more to it than that. And those who have the gospel of hip hop already know what it is. Uh, but it's things like this that inspire young people coming up to be what it is they see themselves as and not get hampered down by social restrictions or some old dude telling you, you got to do it like this. No, that's not what we're about. It's not what the Temple of Hip Hop's about. When I was coming up, I was inspired by everybody. Oh, man, I, 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 man, I take it back to Muhammad Ali. He was an MC. I mean, everybody knows him as a boxer. But Muhammad Ali was a cool MC, man. He used to say some fly rhymes before he knocked the dude out. Brilliant. Uh, 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 take it over, of course, the Watts uh, 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 poets, last poets. Um, uh, oh, man, Gil Scott. Uh, these are just the staples. These, And I'm not just shouting these names out. I mean, the revolution will not be televised by Gil Scott. That is classic poetry, and it documents the time. It was people like Kumo D from the Treacherous, actually the whole Treacherous Three. Um, it, it was actually uh, Melly Mel, uh, these people, MC Shan, uh, Roxanne Chante. Um, these people were actually the seminal figures when I was coming up. I was influenced by a lot of people. I mean, Bob Marley, Yellow Man, um, taking it over there. You, Roy, I, Roy, getting the, 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 the DJ, the sound clash uh, tapes of um, Saxon and Coxon sound and uh, GT International, of course, Stone Love. Uh, all of that, you mesh all of that in uh, with, with, of course, the Little Temptations, Isley Brothers, uh, and you get what what a lot of hip hoppers call their style. Uh, I was really no different in, in, in that regard. I haven't even achieved my greatest achievement uh, yet. I haven't even achieved it yet. The, the greatest achievement, uh, I, I would say, would be my children, the raising raising of, of, of my children. Um, and I'm not achieved in that yet. Uh, in, in, in that sense. Another achievement would be hip-hop itself. The fact that people look at hip-hop the way they do makes me smile today. People don't like the way it sounds on the radio or whatever, but I, I remember when there was no hip-hop and it was, there was no access to radio, there was no access to nothing. Uh, to now see hip-hop everywhere in, in the society in which I live, uh, in my lifetime, uh, to me is absolutely brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I, of course, I'm going to publish more books, albums, everything. Uh, I'm always recording albums. Um, I'm just always recording albums. I'm always in the studio spitting. Tonight, I'm going to do something right now, uh, uh, actually. Uh, you know, I hope we record it so somehow. This may wind up an album somewhere. But book-wise, Gospel of Hip Hop, of course, was 2009. Uh, Ruminations was 2003 before that. And um, 1995 was The Science of Rap. All of these books are first. Um, the ones that are coming out after this is, um, the ones that's coming out after this is um, uh, actually uh, my wife's book, in which I'm editing, called Identifying Your Faith. Um, I'm also putting a piece together called The Real Nigger, N-I-G-G-A, which breaks down where the, the term nigger comes from. Uh, both N-I-G-G-A, the word nigger, as well as the term N-I-G-G-E-R, where they both come from, how people approach it. I don't think a real scholarly, uh, in-depth research has ever been done on the word, but we have so much opinion about it. So I'm writing that up as well. Um, and then there's several other projects as well. I don't want to get, get into something called God's Son, 
uh, which I take off the Nas's album, God's Son, and I flush out the idea of what is God's Son. And I realized through the etymology of the English language that sound was originally sun, or sun was originally uh, more related to sound than it is to a, a male child, uh, a, a, a male child of a parent. Uh, so, having realized that uh, sun in the olden days, pronounced as song, uh, dealt with sound more than uh, the male child of a parent, I opened my eyes and realized that the Son of God is really the sound of God, or could be interpreted as the sound of God. God being a soul sonic force, and we uh, hearing the sound of God are God's sons. When you resonate, resonate, resonate with God, you are God's son. I have a whole piece on this that I outline. That's, that's it, that's what's coming up. So my last words, uh, not even last words, these are really my first words, because uh, this was really on, on my heart. When it comes to hip hop, we have such an ability to reshape our own realities and the reality of the world itself. You got to think more of yourself. That's what the that's what the movement is all about. This movement is all about people who feel worthless, voiceless, powerless, getting a voice, getting a worth and feeling the power. Hip hop offers that. Our parents prayed and prayed, oh, we want to get out the system, oh, we want to be free, oh, we want justice, equality. Then hip hop came and no one recognized it. We only used it, abused it, put it to the side, pick it up when we want, step on it to get to other careers. No one thinks about hip hop itself, how it saved all of us, all the movie stars, actors, all that rappers, executives, all that comes out of a certain mind state that we all collectively call hip hop. And it's this that we have to transfer to our children. It's this that we have to even, we even have to handle it ourselves in such a way that in our older ages, we have something to fall back on. Hip hop is beyond music, way beyond music. Hip hop is the consciousness that creates arts of all sorts. Once you realize what that art is, once you realize what that consciousness is, you're free. And that's what hip hop is all about. Self-creation leading to the ultimate state of freedom. Now I'ma go in here and rip this place down. Not because there's a whole lot of people in here, but because that's what I feel about myself. My faith in myself is gonna make those people feel the faith in me. This is what it's all about. Make the inner you the outer you.